Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, please share, comment, like, and Hulk smash that subscribe button. But now, it is trivia time. We talked about the immensely talented Darwin Cook on the last episode of Off the Beaten Rack, and we explored his first published work from DC's New Talent Showcase in 1985. In that episode, I pointed out it would be 13 years before a long and strange road would lead Darwin Cook back to comics and help to cement the voice of one of the greatest talents to have ever graced the medium. As Darwin Cook is known mostly for his timeless and much more all-ages approach to art and handling of even the most dark and grim subject matter, it might come as a shock to some that Darwin Cook was almost as equally well known for the controversial statements he made and the powerful enemies he managed to earn during his all-too-short life and even briefer period in comics. While Darwin Cook didn't produce an inordinate amount of work, he did create some of the most celebrated and the most important stories of theirs or any other eras for DC, but his Marvel work is limited to a few random work for higher issues and backup stories which all occurred during a short window of time before Cook's work for the company abruptly ceased altogether. Why wouldn't Darwin Cook work with Marvel Comics? What happened that Darwin Cook considered so heinous he wouldn't so much as create a variant cover for them simply overnight? It is in fact perhaps the most discussed of Darwin Cook's illustrious and alleged confrontations and controversies that would infamously lead to Darwin Cook's refusal to work with Marvel Comics in any capacity and a reciprocal banning by Marvel in everything but official writing. Tonight, we're going to talk about why Darwin Cook refused to work with Marvel, and conversely, why Marvel refused to work with Darwin Cook. If you've only ever read Darwin Cook's work, then it might actually be kind of hard to believe he was as controversial as he was during his lifetime. This is especially hard to believe considering he spent less than 20 years in the industry all said. He's definitely most well known and remembered for his DC work such as New Frontier and the Batman Ego graphic novel. He also did some amazing runs on a few books for them most notably the only reboot of Will Eisner's The Spirit that didn't make me want to eat the business end of a shotgun. Darwin Cook had the inexplicably deft ability to distill and illustrate the most noble, grotesque, beautiful, and disturbing aspects of the human experience in words and pictures. It seemed almost effortless. Despite his numerous abilities, it was clear from the beginning of his career that he was being pigeonholed and typecast by publishers as well as writers. He was essentially only called upon to tell a very specific type of story, usually a ubiquitous uplifting superhero tale featuring an obligatory cast of DC's biggest guns. But Darwin Cook always made what should have been over-the-top banal stories beautifully grandiose and almost transcendent at his best. He was also usually afforded a supporting cast of Cook's personal choice of obscure and in his eyes overlooked characters that he utilized in ways other writers seemed unable to conceive of or even begin to comprehend in some cases. Then there was the art. Darwin Cook looked like Alex Toth had the Fleischer Studio Animation Department inking his stuff. It was ethereal and bearing a resemblance to animation, but never straying too far into a cartoonish territory. Cook's art wasn't just another thing that set him apart from the pack, though. It was a weapon for his storytelling. A master of the visual arts, Darwin Cook utilized every aspect of the talents that were at his disposal to make the best and the most meaningful stories from the material that he possibly could. And he was often unwilling to sacrifice these qualities, much to the chagrin of editors and even fellow writers and artists who thought of it as just another job. As we discussed in much more detail in the Off the Beaten Rack episode, everything about Darwin Cook was different from the very beginning. And if there's one constant about the human existence, it's that we're 
often extremely incapable of understanding anything that's different or challenges our conceptions of normality. We're even frightened of it in most cases. Cook's friends described him as a complete conundrum. He was by most accounts an utter maniac to hang out with. Wild, ruckus, and viciously animated, often starting verbal just short of physical arguments at the drop of a hat over the weirdest stuff. He referred to this as his failed romantic side in interviews. Darwin Cook's work by comparison was the polar opposite of this, measured and calm. His mastery of pacing and storytelling is not only entrancing, but was intentionally employed for the most part to create comic books which could be read and enjoyed by people of all ages. There's a marked social aspect to much of his writing, but Cook always felt that politics and the more personal sense of Spider-Man telling people who to vote for should be left out of comics for the most part. Unless you had something to say, something real. Darwin Cook was a man of principles that I believe only he fully understood, but he was a man on a mission. While Darwin Cook did his share of stuff with adult themes, he said over and over again in interviews for years and years to anyone who would listen that the best and the bravest thing that any one of the big publishers could do would be to kill all of their titles and start brand new with an all ages oriented company focused on good solid storytelling and good solid art drawn for people other than 30 something guys in their mother's basements. And then they, they all were writing these comics for each other, not for a mass market, not for young people. And as they aged, the content aged to suit their needs. I think the smartest thing, the bravest and smartest thing one of these companies could do would be to scrap everything they're doing and bring in, and bring in creative people who have the talent and are willing to put in the effort it takes to write an all-ages universe that an adult or a child could enjoy. I want them to stop catering to the perverted needs of 45-year-old men. And when the industry of superhero comics realigns its sights to the young people it's, it was meant for, uh, I'll be there with both arms and feet. <laughs> I'm not sure most comic enthusiasts like being told that they're not the only ones who should be buying comics that the content shouldn't be created specifically and catered only to them, that kids need to read comics for them to survive, that perhaps having characters that show up on your kids underwear and bed sheets involved in rape, murder, and extreme levels of brutality and violence was a sort of moral quagmire for Darwin Cook. This never did go over well for him. Before New Frontier, Darwin Cook was a rising star in the industry, climbing his way through a sea of marginally entertaining, brainless schlock. But after its release, it seemed like the sky was the limit for Darwin Cook. The doors should have started flying open. Instead, after disappearing off of people's radars for a bit, basically, Darwin Cook was involved in an incident that would lead him to not only quit Marvel, but also to a physical confrontation with Marvel staff members, precipitating an essential blacklisting by the publisher. But just what led Darwin Cook to being so angry in that LA bar room that he actually confronted senior editor at Marvel, Axel Alonso, and almost had a fight with him? Well, that depends on who you ask. Cook always talked about how the big two should scrap all of their titles and start over with something that was approachable by a younger as well as an older audience. He thought that the moment when the industry started to cater to the wants of 30-something guys who were hung up on 30-year-old stories like The Dark Knight, which Darwin Cook thought was unnecessarily dark and violent, and Watchmen, which while Darwin Cook did enjoy, had nowhere near the high opinion of it that most other fans, critics, and industry professionals do. This was actually a rather big deal when he worked on Minutemen, one of the Before Watchmen series. Just check out Darwin Cook's quotes, and I do emphasize multiple quotes there about not caring 
what Alan Moore thinks, if anything, about his working on the sequels or the fact that Moore was directly opposed to them being created in the first place or the time that he got in trouble for berating Frank Miller for the extreme over-the-top violence present in The Dark Knight Strikes Again on the DC message board while working for DC. The point is Darwin Cook was extremely extroverted and outspoken and his wishes for an all ages universe for younger readers to enjoy was not a secret and it didn't earn him too many friends in the industry. As far back as you go in Darwin Cook's career, he talked about how the comics industry had become unapproachable and the only thing that could save comics was for a company to just scrap what they were doing and start over with a more approachable all ages line. This is undeniable. It's also undeniable that the Marvel Adventures line basically fits this bill perfectly, or at least it should have. It does on paper, let's say that. And who is behind the Marvel Adventures line? Why, the guy who edited every one of the small handful of stories that Darwin Cook ever did for Marvel, Axel Alonso. According to Darwin Cook, he had proposed, as he often did, his idea for an all-ages line while he was at a meeting at Marvel Comics. This time, though, Alonzo happened to be there, and he got interested. The details of what transpired have never been made extremely clear to the general public. Cook spoke about his side of things sparsely and only when called upon, but as far as I know, Axel Alonso has never addressed the subject of Darwin Cook's claims in any interviews or statements that I am aware of. Darwin Cook claimed that he pitched the idea to Alonzo, came up with a basic business plan, began working on concept art, and even recruited the additional talent required to produce the other titles that would share this common dream of a shared all-ages reboot of the Marvel Universe. Cook reportedly handed plans off to Marvel and went home to work on art and stories. They never called him again. According to Darwin Cook, the idea was passed off to completely different people and he was never consulted about the project. Again, Darwin Cook has stated in more than one interview, he has, quote, more artwork at home than you would believe, end quote, left over from the project. He was never at a loss for words and spoke at great length about even the smallest of minutia having to deal with questions that were brought up to him by fans. He was never a shy guy either, and he didn't squirm away from telling the truth, even when it didn't cast him in the best light. I respected the hell out of this about Darwin Cook, and I believe him when he says stuff because of this. When people brought up the Marvel Adventures line, he had about a one minute, what seemed like a statement that he made. It was always the same, and it was always the end of the conversation. Marvel had stolen his ideas and cut him out for no reason in Cook's eyes, and he could no longer morally bring himself to work for the company, quote, as it existed. By this, I believe he was implying they're still employing what he saw as thieves and liars. Few people ever had the required knapsack to carry their balls in to follow that question up with what people were really interested in, though. Thankfully, the Comics Journal, as in many cases, came to the rescue. They not only asked Darwin Cook about his confrontation with Axel Alonso following the Marvel Adventures line, but they even brought up the Wizard tabloid articles that were sensationalizing the whole thing and painting Darwin Cook out to be some sort of dangerous sociopath. There's been a lot of conjecture over the years, but this is what we know for sure. During an after party, at Wizard World LA in 2005, Darwin Cook went to a local bar where there was a party being held with some friends. He had a few drinks and at some point during that night, he saw and or bumped into Axel Alonso who was there with three or four other individuals before deciding to confront Alonso, presumably about the Marvel Adventures line. As I said before, to my knowledge, Axel Alonso never spoke to these events. Nick Lowe, who was there 
definitely, however, did speak to Wizard and was one of the pivotal players in portraying Darwin Cook as an unprovoked psychopath wandering the floors of the convention where there were defenseless women and children about. Darwin Cook respected the other Marvel editors enough that he refused to use their names in interviews, but Nick Lowe and Axel Alonso were definitely there. Also, along with C.B. Sapolsky, who was name dropped in a CBR article, and I believe Tom Bravort was the last of the four people that Cook referred to whenever recounting the event. Regardless, Darwin Cook approached the table where the four men were sitting, or he and Alonzo accidentally bumped into each other at the bar. And then he proceeded to throw Axel Alonzo's own pint of Guinness into his face, or dump it onto his shirt, or pour it over his head, depending on who is telling the story. By all accounts, he then said, quote, Do you know what this is for? Nick Lowe reportedly held Alonzo back, preventing a fight, and Darwin Cook left the bar shortly after. This is the incident that would haunt Darwin Cook for the rest of his career and was responsible for his being banned from Marvel by everything short of an official statement by the company in text. Though it's painfully clear, I don't know how productive of a relationship Marvel and Darwin Cook could have ever had, given how personally Darwin Cook took the whole thing and how much he distrusted the people there after that. As I mentioned before, the Comics Journal interviewed Darwin Cook in 2007 about the incident, and they really do usually keep a much more level head about this kind of stuff, but even they couldn't help but sensationalize the whole thing, apparently. I hope I'm saying this right. Marcus Naso, the guy who conducted the interview, was personally chosen by Darwin Cook, who apparently had a real proclivity for asking for certain interviewers that he had either a previous relationship with or that he just happened to get along with really well. Darwin Cook and Naso had met a few months prior and become friends. So when Naso asked him about the confrontation with Alonzo, as well as the wizard interview, Darwin Cook did not get up and storm out of the room, but he didn't fully answer the question either. He said that the wizard article about him was true, but quote, myopically one-sided. This seems like a fairly accurate assessment of the article if you read it in full, to be frank. The article essentially begs the question, is Darwin Cook a passionate visionary or an overly sensitive prima donna jerk that wants to start a fight with you rather than talk when he has a problem? If half of the stories Cook's closest friends and co-workers tell her to be believed, which I think they are, it's obvious he was a passionate visionary who may have been an overly sensitive jerk sometimes, and he would definitely physically fight you at a certain point. But there was a reason he was this way, in my opinion. Plus, he always owned up to these things. He didn't try to paint himself in a better light or weasel out of responsibility. Darwin Cook was nothing if not a man of irreproachable integrity, in my opinion. While going into detail with Naso, Cook quickly pointed out that Wizard had interviewed several of his friends for the article, but chose not to include quotes from a single one of them, coincidentally. He seemed like he regretted that it had happened, and kind of apologetic about the whole thing in the Comics Journal interview, so he almost had a complete meltdown when he saw a proof of the cover to that issue. Above his illustration, the Comics Journal had put in large, bold letters, a header about Darwin Cook pouring a drink on a Marvel editor's head. He called up Naso and begged with him to have the cover changed. The cover had already gone to press, but Naso, who, as I said, had become friends with Darwin Cook in the preceding months, managed to get the header changed. Naso spoke about this and how grateful Darwin Cook was for his help after Cook's passing in a really touching statement I'll link in the description below. Despite the controversy that seemed to follow him, wherever he went, just about everyone had amazingly kind things to say about Darwin Cook. Though sometimes they were admittedly amazingly unkind things as well, Cook 
was expelled from school because he was, quote, too busy enjoying himself. And most of the stories I've ever heard about him take place at or on the way to a bar. I'm not saying Darwin Cook was an alcoholic or anything in the sort, but it definitely seemed like when you got a few drinks into him, you were dealing with a very different individual than when he was sober. That being said, I think that it's obvious that Axel Alonso stole Darwin Cook's proposal and probably his entire business plan for the Marvel Adventures line and then pass it off to jobbers that he knew he could more easily control and have tell the stories that he wanted how he wanted them told. Why give that kind of power to a rogue shark like Darwin Cook? Darwin Cook spoke constantly about feeling like an industry outsider despite the levels of prominence and success he managed to reach. He always said that no one really got him. He always felt like he was fighting for scraps and he really wasn't interested in that. The Marvel Adventures line could have really signified something big for Darwin Cook, who also repeatedly stated he couldn't read modern superhero comic books because they were so hyper-violent and sexualized. He talked for the entirety of his career about how there should be superhero books from Marvel and DC that kids could pick up and read and enjoy that weren't filled with violence or hypersexualized imagery. After years of vying for this idea, Marvel said they were into it, or at least Axel Alonso did. This was a lifelong dream come true for Darwin Cook, and I'm guessing he made some sort of verbal or handshake agreement which anyone in the industry will tell you almost inevitably proves to be disastrous. Marvel took his work and did exactly what he didn't want done with it. They told stories he would have never told. They used art and imagery he would never have approved. He was really interested in bringing the sensibilities and the storytelling that he had learned and essentially perfected during his time with Bruce Timm and Paul Dini on Batman the Animated Series to a real line of comic books. Those shows continue to resonate with fans today in 2020, 30 years after their creation, because of the genius of that storytelling. The fact that while there were serious things that happened, they were stories that ultimately kids and adults could enjoy. This was how Darwin Cook remembered comic books being. They weren't for kids. They weren't for adults. They were for everyone. And Marvel was going to give him permission to use their biggest names in stories that weren't connected to any kind of continuity. Stories that would fall out of the jurisdiction of the 616 universe completely. Darwin Cook would be free to tell his stories and to use guys like Spider-Man and Thor to tell them only then to have it all ripped away and not even know it. No single person at Marvel bothered to even call to tell him that they were moving forward without him. They just stopped calling him and that was that. His dream was dead, and I think Darwin Cook was understandably angry about it. I'm not saying that I think he was right to dump a drink on a guy's head or whatever happened. I'm just saying that if you read the stories that Axel Alonso put in those comics, if you look at how quickly that line folded and was rebranded and bastardized over and over again, it is not hard to imagine why Darwin Cook was so upset about the entire situation. Marvel screwed him over and they were never going to let him have his line. So he said, screw it. I really feel for Darwin Cook in this situation, honestly. I'm of the opinion he was deceived by and taken advantage of by Marvel and specifically by Axel Alonso, but I want to point out a few things here for the sake of historical accuracy and to provide as much context as possible for all those involved. For the record, Axel Alonso never publicly made any statements about this altercation. Truth be told, I think he was embarrassed about the entire situation for a myriad of reasons. He did not respond when contacted about the Wizard article, and he never, ever gave an interview where he answered any questions about Darwin Cook in anything other than a very positive light. He had every opportunity to drag Darwin Cook's name through the mud at any time, but he did not. 
but he didn't hire Cook back either, and he didn't extend an apology. Honestly, maybe there's more to this story than we will ever know. But maybe Axel Alonso just felt guilty because he realized he'd stolen and then proceeded to absolutely destroy Darwin Cook's childhood dream. We'll probably never know. What I do know is that this is one of the biggest mistakes that Marvel has ever made. Darwin Cook was a visionary storyteller and a uniquely talented individual capable of sculpting and crafting wholly inhabitable worlds through his storytelling. The way he was able to deftly weave the savvy and knowledge of his growing age with the tender naive sensibilities of a child in a lot of ways is basically unparalleled and the world is a lesser place not knowing these stories. Sometimes I guess there are just no happy endings, even for the good guys. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did, do me a favor, hit that like button. If you really liked what you saw, think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know. It really helps out the channel. If you really, really liked what you saw, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell to keep up with these doses of trivia and all the other content that I'm dropping all the time. If you enjoyed this episode, you have any questions about tonight's episode, you'd like to learn more about this episode or have a suggestion for a future episode, please think about getting in the comment section below as well. I've done some great episodes from viewer suggestions so far. I'm working on a few right now and it really helps the channel out as well when you leave a comment. Thanks again for sticking with me. I really hope you enjoyed and as always, I really truly and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops as soon as you can, maybe even using curbside service if they're offering it, guys. And keep reading comics.